most of it before. But hopefully I'll give you maybe something new to look at or a new perspective. Because mothers are mentioned all the time in the Bible. Mothers are important in the Bible. And mothers are mentioned by name in the Bible. And I'm going to talk about four of them today. But before we get started, you just go to the Lord in prayer with me. Father God, I thank you. <clears throat> I thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. I thank you for all that are gathered here today, Lord. And I thank you that we can celebrate our mothers today. And Father, I know that you put emphasis on that too, Lord. And we, we just want to, we are so grateful that that is the alignment that you set up, Lord, that we would have mothers and fathers, that we would have a family, Lord. And this is a day where we celebrate that special portion, portion of the family, the mother. And Father, I just ask that you give me the words that you want spoken as we go into this sermon, Lord, and that you also, Lord, just open our hearts and our ears to hear what you have to say. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as I'm going through, I'm looking through different ideas for sermons and stuff. I came across something, and I looked at it, and then I started adding things of my own. This is a list of things that <clears throat> my mother taught me. Okay, she taught me logic. If you fall out of that tree, you're not going to town with me. <laughs> she taught me humor. If your toes get cut off by that lawnmower, don't come running to me. <laughs> She taught me things about physical appearance, like if you keep making that face, it's going to stick like that. <laughs> Genetics, you're just like your father. I heard that one a lot. <laughs> Anticipation, of course, just wait till your father comes home. <laughs> Receiving, if you're going to get it when you get home. I, I remember hearing that a lot at church, because you never got disciplined in church. You just had to wait for it to get home. <laughs> Religion, <clears throat> you better pray that stain comes out of the carpet. <laughs> Stamina, you better sit there until all that spinach is gone. <clears throat> One my mother loved, I heard it fairly often, she taught me about the circle of life. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> well, as we go into this sermon today, like I said, I want to talk about four mothers. And what I want to talk about is mothers and the, what they're known for in the Bible and what, what they express in the Bible and why we should be thankful for that. If you've got a mother like this, you should be very grateful. Now, the first one I'm going to talk about is Hannah. Now, Hannah was Samuel's mother. We know that story, and I don't have the, the time to go through the whole story, but I'm, I'm going to background a little bit here, and we're going to talk about that. Hannah was the fourth woman mentioned in the Bible that was infertile. Her husband had two wives, the other, the other wife had given lots of kids. Hannah was um, a very gracious woman in the fact that she kind of kept her mouth closed. The other woman was kind of ordinate over her all the time and she kind of held it to herself and she prayed. So a praying mother is the first thing I want to talk about and Hannah prayed constantly for a child with the, with the full knowledge that she was going to give that child to God. And when she had Samuel, she did just that. After she had Samuel, she had five other children, the Bible says, but after she had Samuel, this is what she did. In 1 Samuel 2, 18 through 20, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen, linen ephod. Each year, his mother made him a little robe and took it up to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, may the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. Each year, from the time that she left Samuel, each year she would go back once a year and take this clothing from him. And each year, she would be prayed over. And she had five more kids. But she prayed for her son, and she prayed for him constantly, and I'm sure we would all be like that. I um, have had the opportunity throughout the years to, to work in different places where there are boarding schools. And PILC is one of them. I've worked over there quite a bit with some of the kids over there. And um, kindergarten through eighth grade. I could not imagine in my life sending a kindergartner away and only seeing him at Christmas in the summertime. I just can't comprehend that. But I know if it had happened, we'd have spent all our time in prayer. When you, can, you pray for him when you can see him. When you can't see him, boy, that, that would have been tough. And this woman was a praying woman, and she was faithful all the way through. So if you have a praying mother, you need to be thankful. 
and you'd be grateful for the fact that you have a praying mother. The greatest prayer warriors we'll ever know are our mothers. And the first person who ever showed us even a glimpse of the love of God was our mom. Moms did that for us. Now, there's a, a passage in Psalm uh, 127.3. This kind of explains Hannah a little bit too. She understood the children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring are a reward from Him. She understood that. And she honored that in her prayer. The second mother I want to talk about is a woman named Eunice. And not everybody may think of it right away when I say Eunice. But Eunice was Timothy's mother. And Timothy, of course, was Paul's right-hand man. He was a young man that he he brought up and he was became a pastor and he got a church and Paul wrote two letters to him. And in uh, 2 Timothy 1, in his greeting, Paul's talking about him, he said, says, I thank God whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded, now lives in you also. So not only... Is there a mother here, but there's a grandmother? There's a heritage of teaching. Teaching the word, teaching faith. There's a heritage here. And I don't know if we know enough of Timothy's background. There's nothing biblical about this necessarily, but you notice there's not a father mentioned. For whatever reason, there's not a father mentioned here. There's just a mother and grandmother. So Timothy was raised by two godly women in his household. And it was passed along from one to another, and it came to him. And he became a, a fundamental uh, portion of the New Testament, and he became a pastor and spread that faith to others. If you have a mother who is a teaching mother and has traded, trained you in your faith, if you have a mother who has helped you, helped guide you as you grew, you need to be thankful. You need to be thankful for a teaching mother. The third mother I want to talk about is the sacrificing mother. And this one, hang on just a second, Pete. And this one, again, I'm going to background this one a little bit, the sacrificing mother. I'm going to talk about Jochebed. Now, Jochebed was Moses' mother. And at the time, in Egypt, the, the Hebrews, the Israelites, had gotten to be too big. They had been blessed with lots and lots of children, and they had grown so big that the Egyptians were afraid of them. And Pharaoh's command at that point in time was, he said, all the midwives are to kill the male children when they are born. we got too many of them, we got to start seeding them out a little bit. So imagine being pregnant at that point in time. Knowing that if you had a male child, he's got a death sentence in an inventory. And there's nothing you can do about it. If you're pregnant, you're pregnant. My wife tells me that once you know, once you get started, it's, it's going to finish. There's nothing, I mean, you've got to go all the way through it. But she's got this situation going now. Well, she does have a little boy. Pete? So we're going to go through a little bit here. It's going to be 1 through 10, but it's going to take a couple of slides to get there. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen. If you have or ever seen or had a newborn, imagine hiding that thing. Hiding a newborn for that length of time. How do you do that? How do you hide away a newborn so nobody knows it's there? But she did. She cared for that baby as long as she could. But she realized that Sooner or later, someone's going to notice that there's a new baby boy around. And she also realized that she was never going to see her baby boy in her household running around like Levi runs around. She was not going to see her child grow up. It was not a possibility for her. Because if they found him, they would kill him. So instead, she took this bold plan, this very bold plan, where she was going to let go of her child 
in the hopes that that would save him. And we had Hannah give him to the to uh, the temple, and she was able to go back and see him on a regular basis. Jacobin had no idea if she would ever see Moses again. She just she puts him in a basket. Now his, his sister's watching, and the story continues. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Well, that's quite a sister. First of all, she's watching. Secondly, she has the nerve to go up and say something, which is pretty impressive. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter comes down to bathe. I'm sure that's not a place you're supposed to be caught. And then she has the audacity and the fearlessness to go up and say, I can find somebody to nurse him, knowing full well she met her own mom. What a sister that is. But there's another mother involved here too that I thought maybe we should mention as well. <coughs> the story continues, yes, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse it for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. So, Jacobet gets Moses back for a while. She, she gets him back for a little while while she's nursing the baby. And afterwards, she gives him up again. Twice she sacrificed this child. Once, just to save his life, not knowing what was going to happen, and once, knowingly giving him to Pharaoh's daughter. The other side of this, though, of course, is that Pharaoh's daughter... took him in as her son. She became a mother there. It was her choice. She didn't need to. This was a Hebrew baby. It had nothing to do with her. She did too. So there, he has both a mother, an earthly mother, and an adopted mother. I thought that was kind of a neat little concept there. But Jacobed sacrificed her son for his good. For his good, she sacrificed him. To save him, she sacrificed him. And while that is a very, very difficult thing to imagine, it is also something we can't understand. I don't think there's a mother here that to save their children's life would not sacrifice their time, their prestige, their their uh, their life with their child just to save it. To save a son or a daughter, you would do anything to do that. I don't think anybody has any doubt whatsoever that they would do that kind of thing. And if you have a mother that has sacrificed for you, that has given for you, you should be grateful. And I think, like I've said in the past, if we look backwards with 2020 hindsight, we will see those times when mom sacrificed for us. I know I did. My mom was raising us alone. After my dad left, I was only 13. The young, my youngest sister was one at the time. And she was raising us alone. We tried to keep the farm going as long as we could. And then when we, when we had to leave, Mom got a job in town because she had to. And as soon as she could, she got us out of there and got us back to a smaller farm that was going to be back-breaking labor and very difficult. But she knew that's where she wanted to raise her kids. She didn't want us growing up in town. She wanted us growing up on a farm. So she went from... We had a very successful farm to having to live in town for a while... <clears throat> And then she bought a place, and we hand-milked eight cows and tried to make a living off of that. And we built up a little bit at a time until we had more, but we never had a big place. But we were in the barn every day, all of us together. All of our kids were in the barn together. All of us spent a lot of time with our mother. She did everything. Mom sewed most of our clothes. She was in the barn milking with us. She was out doing everything she could to take care of us. I remember that. And I remember one time, it was one of the most embarrassing things I ever experienced at the time, and I realize now how ashamed I should be of it. But I remember once when it was really bad, I was in the grocery store with Mom, and she had food stamps. That's back when you actually had the paper ones and you had to hand them to them. And I was standing in line with my mom, and I was so embarrassed by that. 
And I think about it now, and I think about how ashamed I should have been to be embarrassed that my mom was going through all this just to take care of us. She had sacrificed a lot of her personal pride to get to that point because she was a very independent, still is a very independent woman. She just turned 70 this, this uh, last month. Very independent woman, very strong woman, but she would do anything for her kids. And we all grow, grow, grew up and did fairly well in the end. But mom has always been tough. Rheumatoid arthritis, all sorts of things. Put her in a wheelchair, put her in a nursing home when she was in her early 60s. Um, she's had strokes, she's had uh, kidney cancer. Um, she's had a lot of issues. But she's still tough as a bird and I still wouldn't cross her because I know. <laughs> Same thing when, she, when I was 16 years old. I, I've, I've been this size since then. She told me, she's a little lady, she told me when I was 16, and I came home late one day, she said, don't you ever think that I won't stand behind the door with a baseball bat, you will never be too big for me. <laughs> <laughs> she gave a lot of sacrifices, but she, she did all that because of the love. Now the last mother I want to talk about is the one that we probably know the best. Um, just hang on, be. It's the one we think about the most when we think about a mother in the Bible, and that's Mary. Mary, the mother of God. Mary, the mother who bore Jesus Christ. It's the one we think about the most. It's the one we talk about the most. It's the one that comes up in the Bible a lot because the New Testament is full of instances with Mary involved. And in my opinion, Mary is a long-suffering mother. She's a mother who has positive things happening, but she also has foreknowledge of other things happening, and it, her whole life is, is wrapped up in this. We know that by the time Jesus is gone, that his father is gone too, so she is a widow. All sorts of things go on in her life, but she starts as a very, very young girl. And as a very young girl, she's, the angel visits her, tells her she is going to be the mother of the Messiah, and she accepts it. And she's scared, and the angel says, don't be afraid. You found great favor with God. That's a blessing. But with the blessing comes a lot of pain in her life because of that. If she hadn't been the mother of the Messiah, she probably would have had a normal life like everybody else. Would have went fine. She wouldn't have had to go through the ostracization of being a virgin with a baby. She wouldn't have had to have gone through that trip to Bethlehem with her husband who was taking her along, probably because he wasn't sure of her safety. She wouldn't have had to have gone through the looks from the community and all those other things. She had just had a normal life. She was a very faithful woman, even at a young age. So she would have had a normal life. And she sacrificed that because God asked her to. And when she gave birth to Jesus, we start seeing a passage that comes up a couple of times. But she gave birth to Jesus in Luke 2. Verse 19, it says, And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Very thoughtful woman. All these things are there in her mind. Again, it, um, later on, the same sort of thing comes up when she goes, when they go for the dedication. And she's told that it will pierce your heart. This is gonna, this is gonna hurt you. But then, of course, Mary is a mother. She's a mother like any other mother. At the wedding in Cana, John 2, 3 through 5 says, When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They had no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Now, I don't know about you, but if I'd have said something like that, I probably would have got a smack out of that. I'd call my mother woman. Although Pete does it occasionally and gets away with it. <laughs> His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. I picture this scene. They're at this big celebration. It might be family of some sort, extended family, something like that, because Mary's concerned about the wedding party and what's going on. This is the first time Jesus does a miracle. This is the first step that anything happens, and it's because Mom said so. Mom said, they have no more wine. And he knew right away, Mom saying, you fix it. <coughs> and he says, oh, it's not time yet. And she just turns her back on him and says, you just do what he tells you to, and she walks away. Knowing full well that he can, and he will, and because Mama said, you should. Jesus does it. 
even though he says it's not my time yet mom asked so all right i'll do it we know the story about the water and the wine then i'm sure she was proud of her son at that moment in time because he'd taken care of things quietly took care of things well the next thing that happens in matthew 12 48 that same child uh-oh. Oh, no. That same child rejects her. And in Matthew 12, 48, Jesus is back in his hometown, and he's in the temple, and he's preaching, and he's teaching. And people say, wasn't this that carpenter's kid? We know him. And Mary and his brothers and sisters come to the temple and they're outside they're not in with the other guys but they're at the temple and they say um tell them to come out we want to talk to them they know that he's getting to that point where he might embarrass them the people are not going to accept him things aren't going very well and just to have him come out and that's when jesus utters those words who, are my, who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? And he looks around him and says, these are my brothers and sisters. That was the first time Jesus said, no, Mom. I need to do this. And there's a certain amount of rejection that would be felt. But of course, there's a certain amount of pride there, too. But there's a certain amount of rejection. For mothers, that time will come. Eventually, for mothers, that time will come where they will... Where, the ch- where their ch- children will say, I don't really need you to help me with this. Man. I got it. And they can kind of step out on their own. That's a bittersweet moment. So worrying and praying, but it has to go. Someone told them, your mother and brothers are standing outside waiting to speak to you. You reply, who's my mother and where are my brothers? And she gets rejected by her son. Publicly. But she doesn't get forgotten by her son. This long-suffering mother then is going to see her son arrested. She's going to, she's going to follow his ministry all along. She saw him feed the 5,000. She did all these things. She saw all of his ministry for three years, but she also sees him get arrested. And she hears the crowd that a week before had been saying, Hosanna, now say crucify her. She's watching her baby boy, and they're saying crucify him. And he's beaten and he's bloody and the Romans have him. And he's doing nothing wrong. And his mama knows he did nothing wrong. But they're saying crucify him. And he does. He gets crucified and she watches. I have no doubt. She watched the walk. She watched him carry the cross. She watched all that. They followed along. And we know that because at the cross, Mary was there. And Jesus said very few things from the cross. Very few things were actually came out of his mouth that we have in the Bible, what he actually said while on the cross. But one of the things he did was he took care of mom. He looked down and he saw John standing there, and he said, when Jesus saw his mother there, the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, there is your son. And the disciple, here is your mother. From now on, from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. One of the last things he did was take care of mom. So in the midst of all her suffering and all of the stuff she's seeing and all the things that are going on, he still takes care of her. He still says something. He's the oldest son. He's taking care of her. All of these things, as they go through, as we look at Mary's life going through all these things, that's why I said this is a long-suffering mother. She saw a lot of ups and downs, really, 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 really high peaks. She heard God say, this is who your son's going to be. This is what you're going to name him. That's a high point. They had a long traveling time. That's a low point. The shepherds come. The kings come. Everything comes. The magi come. All those things come. It's a high point. She's thinking about these things. But we know the next thing in line is, they got to run to Egypt because Herod's going to kill that baby just like the Egyptians were going to kill Moses. 
and they got to run and hide again. And then they come back, and eventually she loses her husband, and her son is with her. She starts the ministry with him. She watches things happen. She watches all these things go on. She sees the wonders and the glory that her son is doing. That she sees the Son of God. She knows better than anybody else who he is. <coughs> Long before the disciples, when Jesus says, Who am I? And Peter says, You're the, you're the Messiah. Long before that happened, Mom already knew. Mom knew things, these things long before anybody else did. And she kept all these things in her heart. If Mary kept a scrapbook, wouldn't that be cool? In modern day, if Mary kept a scrapbook, she'd have been cutting out all the newspaper articles about, well, he was healing lepers over here, and he was healing these people over here, and he fed all these people over here, and this is the crew that follows him, and here's a picture of all the disciples standing around Jesus, and she'd have cut all those out and put them in a book. And then it got to the point where the cross came along. So while Hannah gave her church or gave her son to the temple to God and sacrificed her time with him, and Eunice trained her son and sent him off to be a pastor, and while Jacobin gave her son away to save him, Mary watched while her son gave himself away to save her. And to save all of us. She watched the sacrifice. But she could have no part in, other than being his mother, she had no part in this. She had there was nothing that Mary did other than give birth to this child. And her child was giving himself for everyone. That's a long suffering mother. But her story didn't end there. She's mentioned again after Jesus, after Jesus uh, died and Acts, Acts 1, 14. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. She didn't give up after the crucifixion. She held herself faithful. Knowing all the things and seeing all the things she did, she held faithful. And she prayed. I have met a lot of really good prayer warriors in the church over the years. Every one of them has been a mother. The most faithful people I've ever seen in a church when it comes to getting the job done, getting work done, to from VBS to the Good News Club, they're all moms and grandmothers and great-grandmothers. <coughs> Their energy never fades. They just keep going. I don't think I ever saw my grandmother eat a hot meal. Ever. She feed my grandpa and me when I was there. And then when times came along that we were all gathered together at Christmas time, she'd be running all over the place while everybody else is eating. And you'd say, Grandma, sit down. But just a minute. Five minutes later, she's still not sitting down. She's still running around. Long suffering woman. Her whole life was based upon sacrifice and giving. And grandma's 90 and she's still kicking and she's still she's still giving she calls us fairly regularly she talks until she's so tired she can't talk anymore she tries to divide it up talk to me and talk to jane usually jane gets the lion's share um because she loves to talk to jane because it's mother to mother talk but she'll do everything she can as long as she can physically do it and then she's too tired and she calls her kids and she calls her grandkids and she does them all on a schedule so that she, she knows she can only go so long that she wears out. We are blessed by God to have mothers. It was his plan from the beginning. Adam came along, image of God, everything's great. And God immediately went, oh, no, 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 we need a woman here. He'll probably mess it up. We need somebody to help him out because he can't do this alone. So God created Eve. And there's another long-suffering woman. One of her sons murdered the other one. But that connection, that direction, where the family unit includes that one caring, nurturing, loving person that cannot be replaced, is God sent. We need to be thankful for that. Now, right up here, 
in this elegant bucket. <laughs> <laughs> there are a bunch of flowers, and if your mom is here, please come and get one and give it to your mom.